can it become a West End hit? First on four, Tony Robinson and director James Cameron embark on the ultimate Titanic adventure. On April the 10th, 1912, this quayside here at Southampton was packed with people eager to climb aboard the largest man-made moving object yet built. The Titanic, the flagship of the White Star Line, was about to sail into history. Most people know what happened next. The so-called unsinkable ship. The iceberg. The lack of lifeboats. And the deaths of 1,500 men, women and children. Since the wreck site's discovery in 1985, archaeologists, scientists and historians have explored and analysed Titanic's rusting hull, unlocking some of her secrets. But Hollywood film director James Cameron, a man who's absolutely obsessed by the Titanic, is leading one last expedition to enter the ship and solve the final mysteries of the world's most famous shipwreck. And he's invited me along to dive with him two and a half miles down to the bottom of the Atlantic. It's an honour and it's a privilege. To say I'm excited is an understatement, but I'm also just a little bit scared. This is St John's, Newfoundland, one of the oldest cities in North America. It's approximately 450 miles from the Titanic's final resting place in the North Atlantic, and it's the starting point of our expedition. And this is the Keldesh, the largest marine research vessel in the world. The Keldesh is going to be home for the next 10 days. I'll be working alongside a team of 50 sailors, divers and scientists. It's equipped with laboratories, satellite navigation systems, a mission control centre, winches, cranes, two state-of-the-art deep-sea submersibles, and hopefully enough lifeboats. With an average speed of only 10 knots, half that of the Titanic, it's going to take the Keldish almost two days to reach the wreck site. We head out over the treacherous Grand Banks of Newfoundland and into the deep water of the abyssal plain of the North Atlantic. I'm scheduled to dive in seven days, so I've got plenty of time to immerse myself in the expedition and meet the team. After making 35 dives and spending over 300 hours exploring the wreck, this is to be Oscar-winning movie director James Cameron's final expedition to Titanic. He's assembled an international team of Titanic experts, from marine archaeologists and scientists to fibre optic cable guys and underwater robotics experts. The Americans, Kiwis, Canadians, Russians and Brits share Jim's passion for all things Titanic. It's like a shuttle, shuttle launch, you know, you get all keyed up, you get in there, you're all installed, you're ready to go. On his last remaining dives, Jim's great goal is to penetrate the wreck deeper than ever before, entering the decadent Turkish baths, the tangled machinery of the wireless room and the luxurious first-class passenger cabins. Oh, to say it's not the clock. Say it is not the clock on the mantle. Oh my God. By exploring never before seen areas, he could finally solve some of Titanic's outstanding mysteries. Did the wireless operators stay at their posts until the bitter end? What time did the cabins finally fill with water? Titanic, despite what you might think or what you might read, is not a closed book. Uh, the story is still full of holes. There's still so much mystery around exactly what happened. 
sure the general picture is understood, but the details, so many details are still in question, are still missing, were never recorded. Artist Ken Marshall paints highly detailed pictures of the Titanic wreck. Everything from rusting rivets to portholes is based on painstaking analysis of video and still images. This forensic approach to the exploration is more like crime scene or air crash investigation than conventional archaeology. Jim's going to attempt to send live video pictures 12,500 feet up from the wreck to the Mission Control Centre on the Keldish. This is where we'll analyse every frame, trying to piece together the minute details of her interior, decoration and layout before she's lost forever. This would be the headboard maybe? Let me see. Titanic has spent over 90 years on the ocean floor and she's deteriorating rapidly. She's covered in bizarre alien life forms known as rusticles. Titanic is literally being eaten alive. This is really weird science to me. It is. It's almost uh, to the realm of science fiction. But looking at other wrecks, Titanic of course was the first, um, but these wrecks, it's happening everywhere. It's a natural process. And Mother Nature is very good at using what's out there and recycling it almost. The science, technology and forensic analysis are all very impressive, but in my mind they get in the way of the real story of Titanic. What interests me is the people who worked on that ship, most of whom started their last voyage back in England. Here in Southampton there are a lot of graves to some of the 1500 people who died when the Titanic went down although many of these graves are empty because the bodies were never recovered. I'd like to find out more about the people who were lost. One in particular, a Robinson, James William Robinson. His body actually was recovered and then it was buried at sea. But he was a ship's victualling steward, which is exactly the same job as my granddad had for the best part of 50 years on the South Africa run. So I do feel quite a lot of empathy with him. Of all the Titanic graves in and around Southampton, this has got to be the most poignant. It belongs to Frederick Fleet. He was the first person to see the iceberg that actually sank the vessel. And he was rescued and continued working at sea for many years until finally in 1965, he took his own life. You'll remember that one of the most enduring stories of the sinking is the one about the musicians who played as the ship went down. It says here, they died at their posts like men. Now, I know loads of musicians. Some of my best friends are musicians, but I don't think I know any who'd do that. I mean, what would be the point? There are monuments all over Southampton to people who died on board the Titanic, including this monumental one to the engineers, who it says showed their high conception of duty and their heroism by remaining at their posts. There are lots of these stories about various crew members who went down with the ship, but is it something that we would do now? Is it actually something that they did then? After 36 hours and almost 400 miles, we're nearly at the place where Titanic foundered. There's nothing here that even hints at the scale of the disaster. The ocean's so empty and vast, it feels a million miles from Southampton. But in a few days' time, I'm hoping to get so close to the place where Frederick Fleet first spotted the iceberg, I might almost touch it. Four years 0% finance, new Vectra and new Signum. Take control. Gourmet salad with caramelized pears and creamy Stilton, drizzled with hazelnut oil dressing. Cookswold pork pie in rich crust pastry, topped with Bramley apple slices. 
sparkling Spanish cava from the chalk hills of Catalonia, served with a splash of pomegranate and raspberry. Sweet, juicy British strawberries with extra thick Cornish clotted cream. This is not just food. This is M&S food. Because our eyes should be able to look and feel as good as they possibly can, buy one pair of glasses from Boots Opticians and get the second free. free to enjoy yourself. That's why Orange is now offering pay monthly mobile customers broadband for free. Orange Broadband. The future's bright. At UBS, financial solutions come from listening very carefully to what our clients say, but even more carefully to what they don't say. You could call it the commitment to understand. We just call it you and us. You and us. UBS. Save up to 20% on your business energy bill. Call the Carbon Trust on 0800 917 3030. A heart transplant is a life-changing event, but for a few, it brings much more. Recipients were reporting receiving the memories, feelings, fears of their donor. It's like two people in one body. Channel 4's new Mindshock series begins with Transplanting Memories, Monday at 10 on 4. Here we are. This is it. Somewhere under my feet is the wreck site that we're looking for. It's an extraordinary thought, isn't it? It's a real ghostly air about this place, and I don't think it's just because I know that the Titanic foundered in these waters. This is where the Labrador current meets the Gulf Stream, so there's always a lot of mist and haze hanging over the sea here. Imagine what it would have been like on a moonless, freezing April night. It's hard to get your head around the extent of this ocean. We're two days out of Newfoundland and we haven't come across one single ship. And it's hundreds of miles in each direction before you hit land. And below us is one of the deepest parts of the Atlantic. It's something like two and a half miles before you reach the bottom. If I chuck this walkie-talkie over the edge, it would be over five minutes before it reached the bottom. Not that that was necessarily the case for the Titanic. Some people say that it would have floated down like a leaf in the wind, although others say that it probably torpedoed down until it hit the bottom with an explosion which was the equivalent of a small nuclear blast. But whatever happened, it buried itself something like 50 feet into the ocean floor. And miraculously, when it landed, it was still the right way up. With the Keldish now positioned over the wreck site, the Russian engineering crew begin prepping and polishing the two subs, called Mirs, ready for the first dive. Are you? Yeah. Yeah. Down? Yeah. Oh, it's good. It's yeah. good. I, was, I wasn't on the Mir down. Uh, very much man. Would. But I uh, go down uh, uh, in, in, uh, in uh, uh, Taos, uh, um, uh, Submarines Argus, Russian submarines. Yeah. I was pilot and go You're down. Pilot. Oh, on the one submarine from Russia. I'm just beating myself up for how racist and sexist I am. I thought Olga was the cleaner and she's a scientist, she